Well, good morning, everyone, and a happy new year. We're still in January, so we're still give ourselves the liberty to say that. Um, delighted to be back again, delighted to be here uh, in many different ways. As Paul said, we had about six inches of snow for the last few days, but it actually cleared up yesterday, and which is we're glad to see. It's lovely to look at, but when you've got to try and get out there and do something, and I had to get my car the MOT. So that was, a, that was a bit of a job getting that done. <clears throat> I want to share with you this morning from the book of Ezekiel. Now, I'm not sure about you, but when I want to read my Bible, Ezekiel's not the first book that comes to my mind. You know, maybe the Psalms or, you know, especially if you're in a hurry or if you're rushed or something. And Ezekiel's one of those books, it's, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? Let's be honest. There's 48 chapters. It's quite repetitive. You know, and uh, if you put that beside Leviticus, you know, you, if you want to give yourself a bit of work, you know, it'll take you a while to get through those two books. But they're full of gold. Um, it, it, it's actually fascinating when, whenever you do take the time. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel has a lot of relevant things to tell us about today. Let me give you an example. I got a present for Christmas Um my family know I like reading about history, so one of them bought me the book, The History of Venice. Don't know if you've been to Venice. Well, people like to talk about a romantic weekend in Venice and, you know, going up the canals and all that kind of thing and looking at all the old buildings and the incredible wealth that Venice has, or rather had. It's actually struggling today, and most people that are Venetians actually have left Venice because of tourism, it's now more, more a tourist spot. But in the past, it was an incredibly wealthy city. It was a city-state, actually. You know, It was like a country of its, all of its own, with its own king called the Dodger. And it became incredibly wealthy through their shipping, uh, the silk trade, um, you know, all kinds of um, wealth that came to Venice through uh, their interaction, their merchants, that went all over the world and were pioneers in many ways in the places, especially in the spice trade, became incredibly wealthy, but also incredibly corrupt. And it came to an end. And it just so happened, as I was reading that, I was reading Ezekiel. And the parallels with the city of Tyre are actually startling. And you realise there's nothing new. And if you read Ezekiel 27 and 28, not going to do that this morning, I'll leave that with you. What I want to do is just give you pointers to say, if you want to navigate through Ezekiel, here's a, here's a good way to do it. It's actually quite chronological. But in Ezekiel, you find how God deals with a, with, with, a, with a city, a prosperous city. A city that becomes so prosperous, it loses its way spiritually. Now, that has happened time and again down through the centuries. Babylon's a very good example where Ezekiel was when he wrote this book. But you could say New York or London or <coughs> Dubai, which looks like it's on the road to that direction at the moment, you know. And people, they get incredibly wealthy and they get powerful and they forget God. And the same happens for nations. And in fact, the prophets of the Old Testament... They all, if you, if you, if you read them, you, very often, the ones that weren't sent to the other nations like uh, Jonah to Nineveh, but very often God begins with Israel, with dealing with Israel. And that is relevant to us because it tells us how God deals with a nation. Yeah. It tells us how God deals with a nation. And so in Ezekiel, you'll find in chapter 8 how God actually tells Israel why he's judging them, why they have been invaded, and why Jerusalem is going to fall. It's because they turned their backs on God. And in chapter 8, God is very specific. He said, here's what you did to my temple. You put engravings of foreign gods all over the walls. You had idols in my temple. And to add insult to injury, you turned your back on my temple to worship the sun, the sun God, the sun that I have created. And so he was very specific 
Because the people in exile where Ezekiel was in Babylon, he was in a village, a bit like a refugee village, because it was he wasn't in a prison cell, he was in a village. He was a captive in exile with a lot of the people who were deported. It's a bit like what the Russians have done to some of the Ukrainians during this war. Taking them, taking them to Russia, and people are not quite sure what happened to them. But here in Babylon, you have these... Israelites, and they find themselves in a village in Babylon in exceptional circumstances, terrible circumstances. They've lost everything. And God intervenes in Ezekiel's life. And you read in the first few chapters of Ezekiel, God reveals to Ezekiel that he's still on the throne, that he's still in charge. And I imagine you've lost everything. Ezekiel actually loses his wife also during the course of his ministry. And God doesn't allow him to mourn his wife because Ezekiel's life became like a message in itself to the people of Israel. In ex exceptional circumstances when the people of Israel would not listen to God, God raised prophets like Ezekiel. And it wasn't just what they said, it was also by their lifestyle that they spoke to God's people. And God asked Ezekiel to do very eccentric, very, very extraordinary things that if he did them today, we would say, this guy's lost a plot here. He needs, he needs to go to hospital. He needs some mental health. You know, he had to lie on one side for days and then lie on another side. And then he had to cut his beard off or half his beard. And then he had to, you know, not mourn his wife. And God had asked him to do all kinds of crazy things. What was he doing? He was drawing attention. He was drawing attention to the fact there's a problem and you're not listening. God was turning the volume up. Even though in Jerusalem they had been invaded twice and loads of people had been deported already to Babylon. Daniel was taken in the first batch and Ezekiel was taken. And they were still stubborn in Israel and they were still hardened in their hearts against God and wouldn't turn to God. And this was the final chapter. And God revealed himself to Ezekiel in a spectacular way. If you read the first chapter, blow you away. Where Ezekiel, out on the plain of Babylon, just outside his village, God reveals himself. And Ezekiel gets a, 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 he gets a, a vision of God with the cherubims surrounding God. Same thing happened to Isaiah. Where Isaiah, and we just sang about it, where he got a... A vision of God and he cried holy. The angels cried holy, holy, holy. <coughs> and it was preparation for a tough ministry. It was preparation for Ezekiel and for Isaiah to say, God is still on the throne despite what is happening in our world today. And can I encourage you to remember that when you watch the news? When you watch Sky or BBC and you hear about the wars and you hear about the cost of living and you hear about the politics and the corruption... And you hear about <clears throat> the famines and the earthquakes and all the things that are going on. And we've just come out of a couple of years of COVID. Remember what God showed Isaiah and Ezekiel. He said, I am still in charge. I am still on the throne. And I am still dealing with nations. And God dealt with Israel, as we know from the Old Testament. And they turned their back on God before God made the final decision. And what you find in Israel is that it, it, it very clearly, in Ezekiel, rather, very clearly God shows Ezekiel and Ezekiel shows the Israelites that God has left the temple. God has withdrawn his presence. The glory of God leaves the temple. And you read about that in chapters um, uh, 13, 14. Uh, and further through, chapter 24, you have the fall of Jerusalem. But God leaves the temple. The glory of God leaves the temple. All those years when there were corrupt kings, God hadn't left the temple. He still had his presence there. There was still, there was still the possibility of going to meet God in the temple. He never withdrew himself up until now. And it was because they had turned their back on God to worship the sun, to worship idols, to be like the other nations. To live a lifestyle that was contrary to what God had recommended. Anything new? In Psalm 9 you'll read that the nations will be turned into the grave or sheol or hell. And all those that forget God. 
when a nation turns its back on God, and it doesn't matter how big they are, whether they're an empire like Rome or Babylon or Greece or, or you know, or Britain or the British Empire or, or the French Empire or, you know, in more recent years, in more recent centuries, which is now a big topic of debate when it comes to statues and all kinds of things that we have on our cities. When a nation turns its back on God, there are consequences, serious consequences. And God doesn't have his favorites. Don't forget that Israel thought they were God's people. And they were. They were God's chosen people. You know, I was brought up to believe God in Ulster. I'm a prod, so God has to be on my side. So I can live any way I like. That's, that's what happened in Israel. They thought, well, we're God's people. We're the children of, Israel, of Abraham. We can do what we like. No, you can't, God says. And in chapter 18, I want to just read a few verses with you in case you think I'm just going to waffle. <laughs> in chapter 18, we read this. The word of the Lord came to me. And God's asking a question. He says, what do you mean? By using this proverb concerning the land of Israel. This was a saying that yeah, you know, that they they would, you know, just flow from the lips of people. You know? Like father like son, we would say, you know, something like that, you know. And and it became just part of the language. And in in Israel they would say, The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And what does that mean? That means, well, the, the father's lifestyle affects the children. And verse three it says, As I live this is the declaration of the Lord God. You will no longer use this proverb in Israel. Look, every life belongs to me, or all souls are mine, saith the Lord, if you've got that version. Every life belongs to me. The life of the Father is like the life of the Son. Both belong to me. And what God is saying here is, I have the right to judge them. They're mine. All souls are mine, says the Lord, even yours and mine. That's an awesome thought. Because we live in a society where we value our freedom. And I have said it to my parents when I was a teenager, and my kids have said it to me. It's my life, I can do what I like. Well, God might have something to say about that. And that's what he's saying here. Because what was happening was, the people in exile were blaming the parents for it. They were saying, yeah, we're in this situation because of what they did. And it's an easy let out thing, isn't it? Blame your parents. <laughs> now, I know our parents are not, my parents were certainly not perfect. And, and, and they weren't believers. And they didn't have the perfect marriage, but they loved us dearly. And they were great parents. But in certain circumstances, it, it was easy for me to turn around and say, that's my dad's fault, that's my mom's fault. And what What's happening in Israel was they, they were blaming it in the previous generations and saying, Aye, this is, look at the state we're in. And what God is doing here is saying, hold on a minute, you have a choice too. Here's what he says. Look, every life belongs to me. The life of the Father is like the life of the Son. Both belong to me. The person who sins, who's the one who will die? And he's basically saying, you're responsible for your own sin. You're responsible for your own choices. And it's a fantastic chapter, actually, because the exiles are wondering, why are we in exile? We're God's people. Why is this happening to us? We haven't done anything wrong. And they're basically accusing God of being unjust. And if you go down the chapter, verse 7 says, He doesn't oppress anyone, but returns his collateral to the debtor. And, and, and so he goes into a whole debate here about who owes what to who and who pays who and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you go down the chapter a little bit further, um, verse 19, but you may ask, why doesn't the son suffer pun punishment for the father's iniquity? Since the son has done what is just and right, carefully observing all my statutes, he will certainly live. The person who sins is the one who will die. See, in some countries and cultures, actually, if one member of a family does something wrong, any member of the family can pay for it. That happens in northern Albania. It's called the blood 
a blood culture where, you know, if somebody does something wrong to somebody else's family, the other family will, will kill any member of that other family that they find. Crazy, isn't it? That's the world we live in. That's what happens when you go outside the boundaries of God's, God's law and God's guides. And here he's basically clarifying that God holds the individual responsible for what they have done and what they have said, not for what somebody else has done and what somebody else has said. Verse 21, Now if the wicked person turns from all his sins he has committed, keeps my statutes, and does what is just and right, he will certainly live, he will not die. Verse 23, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? The answer is no. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You can imagine how he grieves for the death with the death of the just. It's interesting. Peter quotes this in the New Testament. <coughs> you find some of this thinking back in the New Testament. You find it in the Psalms. I was reading Psalm 10 this morning. Here's what it says. Fa fantastic Psalm. Uh, David's asking himself the same questions here about wickedness and who prospers and who's, who pays for it. Ver Psalms 10 says this. O Lord, why do you stand far away? Why do you hide when I'm in trouble. That's what the exiles were saying in Babylon. The wicked arrogantly hunt down the poor. Let them be caught in the evil they plan for others, for they brag about their evil desires. They praise the, gr the greedy and curse the Lord. The wicked are too proud to seek God. They seem to think that God is dead. Yet they succeed in everything they do. They do not see your punishment awaiting them, and so on and so forth. It's the same argument. Where are you, Lord? I can imagine the people at the moment in Ukraine are asking themselves questions like that. What's happening? What have we done to deserve this? And in the middle of all that, God is saying, you live the life that you should live. You make the right choices for you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths even in the heart of suffering. Ezekiel, I will come alongside you. I will open up the heavens to you. I will give you visions. I will reveal to you things that the world in all the world's universities do not know. He did the same with Daniel. He did the same with Isaiah. He did the same with the other prophets. In difficult times, God will draw near to you if you open your heart to him. And he will give you the grace that you need. And he will show you things about himself. About what's happening in our nation. About what happens in a city. Like Tyre. But also what happens in the lives of individuals. And God is saying here. Make the right choices. Even though you're in the wrong circumstances. Keep making the right choices. Trust the Lord. And do what's right. And he will guide you. And he will bless you. Even when you're in exile in Babylon, far away from your own country, you've lost your house, your job, possibly your identity, God said to Ezekiel, hang in there. It's not over yet. And so you find in this book of Ezekiel, God deals with a nation, Israel. He also deals with the other nations because he goes on to talk about the nations surrounding Israel. So nobody gets off the hook, actually. God doesn't let any nation off the hook. And that applies to our nation today. We trust in God more than we trust in men, don't we? We trust in God more than we trust in our, our political leaders or any other leaders. God is our judge. And we are more worried about what God thinks about, about us than what others think about us. That's the rule that the Apostle Paul lived by. And we find in Ezekiel... Here's a good way to remember. Ezekiel chapter 8, God tells you why he's dealing with the nation the way he is. Ezekiel chapter 18, God's telling you why he deals with individuals and how he deals with individuals. In Ezekiel chapter 28, God actually shows us how he deals with a city, but also he reveals in that chapter. It's a fascinating chapter. I recommend it to you. If you don't read the whole book, read chapter 28. Because God shows us the origin of evil itself. In chapter 28, 
he's talking about the city of Tyre, and all of a sudden you realise, hey, he's, no, he's talking about something more than the city of Tyre here. He's talking about Satan. He's talking about an angel. And he opens up a whole uh, passage on the origin of evil and how Satan, who Satan is, and how he fell. And he talks about a cherubim uh, who, who was a beautiful creature and whose job it was to bring the worship to God. Let me read some of the, the verses to you. Chapter 28 says this, verse 12. Son of man, lament for the king of Tyre. He's talking about the city of Tyre and then he talks about the king of Tyre. And when he starts to talk about the king of Tyre, you realise he's talking about more than just the king of Tyre. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, lament for the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the Lord God says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Well, the king of Tyre wasn't in Eden. Must be somebody else. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every kind of precious stone covered you. Carnelian, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald. Your mountains and settings were crafted in gold. They were prepared on the day you were created. Satan is a created creature. You were an anointed guardian cherub. In other, you know, in other words, he was like an archangel. In the highest order of angels. For I had appointed you, you were on the holy mountain of God, that's heaven. You walked among the fiery stones. From the day you were created, you were blameless in all your ways until wickedness was found in you. Wow. Verse 17, your heart became proud because of your beauty. For the sake of your splendor, you, you corrupted your wisdom. So I threw you down to earth. He was thrown out of heaven. And we know the consequences. Verse 18 says, You profaned your sanctuaries by the magnitude of your iniquities and your dishonest trade. And you can see how God marries the activities of Satan with the wealth that trade brings and the power and the pride and the arrogance. Does that look familiar to you? When you're reading about J.P. Morgan, the bank in Wall Street, and the salaries that some of these get, and then you read about their lives, and you read about some of the richest movie stars in the world, and, the, and then you read about your lives, their lives, and you realise something doesn't tie up here. Pride's got the better of them. Some of them actually behave like they're God, the way they treat other people. And here... What Ezekiel's doing, what God is doing through Ezekiel is he's revealing something profound to us. The origins of wickedness and evil. You were perfect and blameless until wickedness was found in your heart. What was that wickedness? Your heart became proud. What's our biggest challenge in life? Pride. Let's be honest. It infiltrates every area of our lives. We get proud of our children above somebody else's children. We get proud of their, you know, their qualifications or their, their abilities or, or, or how pretty they are or beautiful they are. You know, we get proud of our cars. We have a better car than... We get proud of our houses, don't we? We get proud of our clothes. We get proud of everything. Especially if we can do something that somebody else can't do. It, and the old devil comes along and says, you really are somebody. <laughs> Doesn't he? He feeds it. He feeds it. You know, I know my Bible better than he does, and he's preaching. You know, and, and that's all that. He feeds it, and he feeds it, and he feeds it. And the Bible said, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he was humble, and he was the Son of God. You can see what I'm saying here with Ezekiel. Aren't there some interesting passages here? How God deals with a nation, the nation of Israel and the other nations. If they turn their back on God, there are consequences. Chaos reigns. Mm. When you're watching the news, remember that. Sad to say, our nation leaders rarely mention God. There was a time when they would have prayed in the House of Commons. 
many of these institutions that are now around us, the NHS, education, started with people who had a deep faith in God. There's no time for that anymore. There are consequences. Don't be surprised when you see the consequences. Satan is out to destroy and create chaos. That's what we're seeing in our world today. But in the middle of all that, God says, but you as an individual, I will treat you personally, individually. And if you follow me and if you obey my, my word, I will bless you. Isn't that wonderful? You know, some people, when they talk about the prophets like Ezekiel and other prophets, they call them prophets of doom. Ask yourself this question. Is Ezekiel a prophet of doom? So far, yes. Or is he a messenger of hope? I haven't finished yet, but I'll be quick. The wonderful thing about the book of Ezekiel is that as you begin, you work your way through the book, you see the judgments, judgment on Israel, judgment on Tyre and the king of Tyre, you know, judgment on Satan. You can see even in, in chapter 28 where Satan is cast out of heaven and he's trying to do his, but he's already judged. His days are numbered. And you find as you come further through, in chapter 38, God's judgment on the whole world. Where he talks about the final battles that are going to take place. Where God is going to intervene in our world. The nation, city, individual, the world. God is going to deal with all of it. And he's in charge. But here, let me finish with chapter 37. Now, we haven't time to go into chapter, chapters 40 to 48. But can I say, if you want to cheer yourself up, read the last couple of chapters of Ezekiel. They're actually very similar to the last couple of chapters in the Bible. It talks about a new Jerusalem. It talks about the river of life. It talks about trees that give their fruit every month of the year. I can't wait to see those trees and to taste them. I'm sure they'll taste delicious, whatever fruit they are. But Ezekiel's book finishes with hope that God is going to establish his kingdom on earth. And there will be tremendous blessing. He's a messenger of hope. But sometimes to give the hope, you've got to diagnose the real problem. Let's be honest. We, we sang a lot. And we remember the Lord this morning. And we speak a lot about sin. Outside of these walls, you don't hear many people talking like that, do you? Let's be honest. You're not going to hear about sin on the 6 o'clock news, are you? It's a taboo subject, isn't it? And yet if you don't, acknowledge our sin there's no remedy from God if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us that's what Ezekiel's saying he will forgive you he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked just admit it and here in chapter 37 this is a fantastic chapter Ezekiel while he's a prisoner God actually does a kind of a beam me up Scotty thing with him you know like Star Trek he takes Ezekiel in a vision by the Spirit to Jerusalem. He takes him to a valley. He, it's amazing where he takes... Uh, in one vision, it actually says that the, the angel grabs him by the hair and carries him, which is quite humorous when you look at it. So I wonder how that worked, you know? But here we see it, he's in a valley, and it says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out of it by his Spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley and they were very dry bones. So it didn't look pretty appetizing to me. I mean, it's not the kind of place you go for your holiday, is it? And God asks Ezekiel a fantastic question. He says, son of man, can these bones live? Now they were very dry, meaning they were dead, dead, dead. They were the stuff of archaeologists. I wonder how, I'd love to wonder what the carbon dating on these bones were. But God says, can these bones live? Ezekiel's smart enough. He says, Lord God, only you know. You remember Peter had to learn that lesson with, with the Lord Jesus, you know, Lord, you know. I replied, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. Now, be encouraged if you're trying to share the gospel and people aren't interested. Here's a man told to talk to dry bones. 
<laughs> and sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? You're trying to share that your, your faith with somebody and it feels like you're talking to a brick wall or dry bones or somebody who are totally disinterested and you think, this is a waste of time. It's not. Mm. It's not. The Word of God can penetrate into the very heart, into the very soul. And it can come back at a time when that person finds themselves in trouble. And that's the thing the Holy Spirit reminds them of. I've heard this many times in testimonies. So Ezekiel is obedient. He said, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you and make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Do you know that's the most popular expression in the whole book of Ezekiel? You'll read it dozens of times. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Then you will know that I am the Lord. God is saying, I am here and you're going to see it. You're going to find out. And this is what, so he prophesied as he was commanded. And I, I don't know. I would have loved to have known how Ezekiel experienced this, but imagine a valley full of dry bones. And it says in this passage, we don't have time to read it all, the bones began to move. It's like a movie, isn't it? It's like one of those zombie movies. Only these aren't zombies. And if you read down the passage, which I recommend, it becomes an army. The Lord's army. And who does that remind us of? Who raises the dead? Who rose from the dead? Who has victory over death? The Lord Jesus. And we have come this morning to remember his death, but to remember his resurrection. And to remind ourselves that we are messengers of hope. There is hope. Don't lose that hope. Feed it. Live on it. Share it. We are messengers of hope because we know someone who has conquered death and has the power over death. You know, when I meet my Ukrainian brothers and sisters, they know this. Mm. Some of them know it as they go into battle. It's sad to say it's also true on the Russian side where believers have been conscripted, find themselves in the front line through no fault of their own. But they have the hope of the resurrection, don't they? It changes everything. It changes everything when you know you're going to see your loved ones again who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. It changes everything when you go out every day to drive your car not knowing who else is driving out there. It changes everything when your children cross the world and you can't be there to help them if they get into trouble. We have a God who raises the dead, who brings hope, and we can say, Oh, death, where's your sting? Now, there's other passages in Ezekiel that will remind you about Jesus. Chapter 34 talks about the shepherds of Israel who were bad shepherds, and then it talks about the good shepherd. And we know the Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. So I hope I've whetted your appetite a little bit. Now, persevere, even with books like Ezekiel, because there's lots more in there. The origin of evil. Chapter 28. How God deals with nations. Chapter 8. How God deals with individuals. Chapter 18. And how God's going to deal with our world. Chapter 38. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you put hope in our hearts. That you are a God of hope. And Lord, we pray that our hope will overflow. And that others will see that we are messengers of hope. And that we are people who live with hope. In a depressing world, in a challenging world, in a world where many people are struggling to cope with bills and with mental health and with health and with all kinds of things, Lord, we just pray that you would help us not to get caught up and, and dragged down by that. But Lord, we pray that you would draw near to us and we would, like Ezekiel, have a very real sense of your presence and your reassurance we thank you for your promises, Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us. And we pray for those in our families who are ill just now, others who are maybe facing challenging times, others that are suffering. We just bring them all to you, Lord. Our parents, our children, our loved ones, 
We pray for our wider family circles too, Father, and we pray for this village of Ballyhalbert, Lord, and the witness and the light that's shining here, Lord, that people would realise this is a place where they can find hope. We just bring to you the evening service and pray you'll bless our brother Paul as he shares the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for him. Just bless us today, we pray, Lord, and pray that we would be a blessing to those around us. In your son's precious name, amen. God bless.